Greetings. It is I, the Great One himself. Cynical Libertarian Society, founder of 10 years of podcasting. Just reminding you of that. 10 fucking years. CYNLIBSOC.com on the interwebs and CYNLIBSOC on the Twitterverse. You ever have those days where you just don't have any motivation? I got one of those today. A late night at the theater last night actually wasn't that late. Late ish. I've had much later. I was home before midnight. Anytime you get home from the theater before midnight, that's a good thing. I stayed in bed too long today, got up, went trail running, and god damn it, I just have no fucking energy. No motivation. So I've been very pathetically putzing my way through the day here. It's going on 7 o'clock, and I'm feeling pretty worthless. This week coming up is going to be busy as shit. I want to talk some more. I finished the movie Air Force One. I talked about Air Force One. Air Force Air Force One, the movie with Harrison Ford, in the previous edition of Anarchy Moment. I want to talk about that some more. <clears throat> Pardon me. Before I go to Air Force One, let me talk briefly about Lost in Space, because I have no notes for Lost in Space. I've talked a little bit about Lost in Space, the original TV series, and I want to talk more about it, because there's a lot of interesting, to me commentary, you know, political, social, economic metaphors to be found. And there's some great, there's just some great stuff. I love the Lost in Space TV series for the most part. It's one of those things that's, well, let me not talk about that right now. Let me talk about that later. Ah, oh, fuck. If I could ever stay on topic, it'd be great. After watching Air Force One, which stars Gary Oldman as the bad guy, and of course did his usual fantastic job, he's a great actor, that reminded me that Gary Oldman also played the bad guy, Dr. Smith, in Lost in Space, the movie. So I decided, what the fuck, I'm going to pull the movie out and watch it. So I haven't seen it in years. Gary Oldman does a really good job as Dr. Smith, and sort of channels some of the original Dr. Smith's mannerisms. And, of course, we know the lines were written by the scriptwriters and everything, but he pulls it off really well. Also, in the movie, I actually really like... I find I'm liking the guy who plays Major West a lot. I think he's a really good Major West, and the character Major West should have been. And, I mean, everybody in the movie is good. It's good acting all the way around. And, of course, the chick who plays Judy, whose name I should remember, but I can't. She's pretty She's pretty hot. I'd do her. What else? Is I, oh! I think about... Oh, then there's the shitty CGI. You can tell this movie, that's, that implies that there's such a thing as non-shitty CGI. There's a lot of shitty CGI in the movie, which is kind of sad. But it is what it is. And of course, the movie's about how the Earth is being destroyed and we're gonna, you know, the Earth is going to become uninhabitable, so we got to go to another planet. And there's terrorists who are trying to stop the Jupiter mission from going to this other planet because we obviously have to have terrorism because that's an ongoing thing. But then the other interesting thing that, to me, illustrates the downward spiral of our society... And unfortunately, it is our society, because we're all here. We're all stuck in it. At least those of us in the United States of America. If you're in another country, hey, you have a different society. I'm sure you're in your spiral of your own. But of course, in the original Lost in Space, the family was fairly tight-knit. And they talked to each other, and they got along, and they were normal. And Professor Robinson was in command, and he gave orders, and people obeyed, and all this other good shit. You know, basically, it was, it was patriarchy. It was leave it to beaver in space. It was father knows best in space. 
and certainly the kids were kids. Will went off and did dumb stuff sometimes because he's a kid, and Penny did dumb stuff sometimes because she was a kid, and Judy did st dumb stuff sometimes because she was a teenager, and Maureen was really didn't do much dumb stuff. I mean, Maureen was a mom. She was looking out for the family, and she did what she was told and what she was supposed to, and in some of the episodes where... Professor Robinson and Don are away, whatever, she takes charge and she makes shit happen and she makes decisions. And they were all, you know, it was a functional nuclear family, which of course in the year 2015 is patriarchy. It's something you're not allowed to see. Because the narrative is that the nuclear family a mother and a father raising the children is evil. That it is patriarchy. It all comes back to patriarchy. And so, of course, the family in the Lost in Space remake is all mostly completely, mostly completely, <laughs> mostly completely, <laughs> It's not completely, but it's mostly. It's mostly completely dysfunctional. You know, mom and dad get around to making out when they have time, but the rest of time they're arguing, and Judy is all distant and working on the job all the time, and then Penny is some kind of like a little slut, and Will, you know, his father never pays attention to him, but he's a genius. So it's this dysfunctional family thing that we have to deal with. Because you cannot show a functional nuclear family. And yeah, this movie wasn't made in 2015. I'm not sure how long ago the movie was made. But still, even when this movie was being made, when this movie was made, whenever that was, showing a functional nuclear family just couldn't take place. So, so far, I mean, it's, it's okay. I can see, you know, there are reasons why the Lost in Space remake didn't exactly capture the imagination and attention of the world. This is pretty, it's pretty average, let's put it that way. Considering how much money was dumped on this is pretty average. There are some nice little nods in it to the original TV series that I like. And I did, when, after it first came out, I was expecting to see a sequel, because of course they totally set it up for a sequel, but then again, I'm surprised, not surprised, that that did not happen, because the movie is very, very average, and the CGI sucks. Alright, Air Force One, let's talk about Air Force One. First thing I want to say about Air Force One is, the fax machine saves the day, because they were able to send out a fax that enabled everybody to escape from the airplane. The fax machine saves a day. Hell yes for ancient technology. Of course, fax machines weren't ancient at the time, were they? Alright, let me look at my notes here. Let me talk about stuff. The reason the bad guy, played by Gary Oldman, I don't remember anybody's name, so I'm going to refer to the bad guy as Gary Oldman and the president as Harrison Ford, because I don't remember character names, because I don't care. The reason Gary Oldman hijacks Air Force One and does all this stuff is because he's motivated by statism. He wants Mother Russia as he, you know, to be dominant. So Mother Russia has this president who's sort of this stand-in for Gorbachev, who's supposed to be democratizing things, yada, yada, yada. And at the beginning of the movie, it's the hardliner general who wanted to go back to the old Soviet Union. And Gary Oldman is taking, he hijacks Air Force One because he wants this hardliner general who's going to go back to the old days of the Soviet Union to be released so he can have power. Think for a minute, and yes, it's only a movie, but think for a minute about how many people out there are really like this. How many people... I mean, think about it. When, when these people flew these airplanes into the buildings on 
what were they doing that for? When people go out and kill, when, when American soldiers kill other human beings because they're told to, This is a character who was entirely motivated by statism. He was willing to kill other people so that another person could be in charge of the geographical fiction known as the Soviet Union and kill people within the boundaries of that state. And Gary Oldman does a great job of portraying this fanatic. There's a great part in here where he's got the president's daughter and he's talking to her. I'm looking for the notes where I wrote this down. Oh, previous to this, I'm like, my handwritten, completely unorganized notes. Gary Oldman's character says that this is almost a quote. I tried to write this down word for word. I would turn my back on God for Mother Russia. And the scary thing is, there are probably a lot of sick people out there who feel the same way. And where there may not be a God, he then further clarifies because he said something about he would he would abandon or he would turn his back on or something like that his own morality for the state, right? These people, I would, I would turn my back on God for Mother Russia. Even if you don't believe in a God, there's this idea there. It, it, you can substitute for God morality. You can substitute, or that's not the way I want to say it. You can make it analogous. When he says he'd turn his back on God for Mother Russia, it's like saying he would turn his back on doing the right thing for the state. I would turn my back on human decency for the state. A little bit later, I think it's in the same speech. And this is, this is also, to me, this is always the indicator of well-written characters, especially well-written bad guys. Because it's always easy to sympathize with the good guy. But when you can, when you have bad guys that you can sympathize with, that's even better. And of course, this guy's very nasty. He just said he would turn his back on God from Mother Russia. He would abandon his own morality for Mother Russia. He's killing these people so that this general can be the leader of Mother Russia and kill people in Russia. And then he makes this great point when he says to the president's daughter, he says something like, you think I'm different from your father, blah, blah, blah. And then he says... Quote, your father kills in a tuxedo with a telephone and a smart bomb. And as much as I can despise Gary Oldman's character for being this statist, for being this delusional fuckwad, Even the most delusional fuckwad is right, sometimes. And it's true, the President of the United States, Hussein Obama, George Bush, Harrison Ford in this fictional account, they're all murderers. Just because they kill from the safety of the White House, just because they have other people, like the Gary Oldman character, who are willing to kill for them, does not make them less of the killers. As I have pointed out before, and will point out right now, and will point out again in the future, Adolf Hitler never killed any Jews. Government employees killed the Jews for him. Roger Waters did a great album called amused to death based on the book which is somewhere on my shelf 
which I think is called Amusing Ourselves to Death or Amused to Death or something like that. I can't remember the name of the author. I don't see the book right this minute and I don't want to get out of my chair. It's a brilliant book. It's on the reading list on the website. You should absolutely read it. And among the many fantastic lyrics on this Roger Waters album, Roger Waters, of course, being a liberal Democrat, or maybe not a Democrat, he's from England, but he's a hardcore liberal. He hated George Bush. You know, he hates Republicans. He hates rich people, just like David Gilmore, who does the theme song for stating the obvious. Fucking, you know, left-wing, liberal, socialist, cocksucking piece of shit. And like all left-wing, cocksucking pieces of shit, Roger Waters was anti-war, when a Republican was president of the United States. As soon as Obama got elected, suddenly Roger Waters didn't have any anti-war efforts left in him. But this album is just as timely today as it was back then because basically he, was, he did an entire album about his disapproval of the war in Iraq as led by George Bush. And there's this great line in one of the songs about killing with the bravery of being out of range. One of, the, one of the lyrics is, they came to maim with the bravery of being out of range. And I've talked about this before in much older episodes. For those of you who are new to the show, I was in the military. I was in a light infantry unit. I was not a fucking file clerk or a mechanic. I was trained to kill people. I've carried a weapon. I've shot bullets at humans. I may or may not have killed anyone. You'll never know because it's none of your fucking concern. I love people today in the military who are like mechanics and just shut the fuck up, man. Just shut the fuck up. Even when I was in the military, I don't think I was this much of a statist fucker. But I've talked about this before. The difference between killing someone on the battlefield face to face with a rifle or a pistol and seeing them die. Killing someone and looking in their eyes as they die. As opposed to killing someone in Afghanistan from the White House. And I mean, yes, I have called the people in the military today cowards, and I will continue to do so. They kill with smart bombs, they kill with flying robots, they kill with cruise missiles, they kill by bombing, they kill with sanctions. I guess the military doesn't use sanctions, but the government does. If you're so desperate and gung-ho to kill people, go and kill them face to face like a fucking man. And people may out there may say, this is an anarcho-capitalism. No, but it is being a man. I don't advocate killing people for no reason. I certainly advocate killing people in self-defense. But I think what I'm getting at here is Throughout the movie Air Force One, people are telling the president what a great man he is and what a hero he is and how brave he is. And in his functions as the president of the United States, all he's doing is killing people from a distance through other human beings. Now, of course, in the movie, and let me also just point out, <clears throat> excuse me, let me point out that this is a great movie. Now, just as a boy, as a man watching this movie, it's great. It's an action movie. You got Harrison Ford. He's badass. He's playing this character who's fucking fighting the bad guys to save his wife and his daughter. And there's fucking technology and there's missiles being shot and there's a giant aircraft. And, you know, there's all this shit that if you're a real man, you can't help but love that stuff because it's a movie about a man facing overwhelming odds and he's trying to fucking win. He's, he's up against the wall and he's in deep shit and he's got to fucking 
overcome the odds and he's got to be victorious. He has no fucking choice. That failure is not an option. He must be victorious because he's trying to save his wife and his daughter, which is, of course, patriarchy and evil. And then, you know, never, never mind. I mean, nowadays, any smart man would just let the bad guy kill his wife because his wife is probably some feminist cunt who's getting ready to divorce him and his daughter is probably a whore. But again, this is fiction, which is why we boys like it. And there's great technology. There's F-14 Tomcats and they're firing missiles and shit like that. And Air Force One is a great giant piece of technology designed to help oppress people and enslave people. Yeah, but it's great technology. So it's a great movie. It's a great action movie. I mean, I was fucking into it. It's good. I'm reading my notes. That's why it's quiet. Oh. All the people in this movie are loyal to one of two men. Or in love with one of two men. I can't read my own writing. Yeah, everybody in this movie, the bad guys, are all in love with this General Raddick, whom they think should be the leader of Russia because somehow or another these bad guys are more qualified to determine who should be the leader of Russia than everybody else in Russia, assuming you believe in democracy and assuming you believe in having a state. And then everybody else, of course, is in love with the president. It's like, oh, Mr. you're so great. Oh, Mr. we have to save. There's all these people throwing themselves so the president doesn't get shot with bullets. And there's this one point where the MiGs show up, MiG fighter aircraft from Soviet Union or former Soviet Union. They fire a missile at Air Force One and for some whatever reason or another malfunctions as Air Force One has been damaged a lot. Air Force One's automated countermeasures have failed. So the missile's coming in. So one of the American fighter pilots, because the fighter, American fighters are right there taking on the MiGs, flies his aircraft in front of the missile so the missile hits his aircraft and kills him instead of hitting Air Force One. Now, to me, this is the fucking sickness of the state. This exemplifies... Now, of course, in the movie, just in the context of fiction, it was awesome. It was, I hate that word awesome. I just used it. Sorry about that guys. I sound like a fucking 14 year old girl. In the context of the movie, it was moving. It was heroic. It was like, oh fuck yeah, man. What a, what a guy. But in reality, can you imagine what kind of a fucking loser would you have to be in order to give your life for a fucking politician. And you might say, well, but this fighter pilot was giving his life for the politician's daughter and his wife. Well, his wife is a feminist cunt and his daughter's probably a whore. What kind of... I mean, think about it. How many... Well, and I shouldn't say that because a lot of you would. Think about the people who would throw themselves in the way of a bullet that was heading for, for example, one of Obama's daughters. What kind of scumbags are these people? Obama has murdered the children of other people. Yet there are all sorts of folks out there who would take a bullet to save his nasty, filthy little spawn. There are a lot of things in this world worth dying for. Politicians are not one of them. Hmm. Not sure what that note means. I'm reading my notes. All this for the president is one man, really that important. At one point, somebody says about the president, quote, he has no right to take chances with his life, unquote. Actually, he does. In anarcho-capitalism, you own your own life and you can take whatever chances you want with it. But again, all of this, 
this this movie it shows us the fucking great man theory in action it shows us how desperately people need a God. That there's this one man, the President of the United States, who's so fucking important that we have to devote all of these resources to keeping him alive. Because the world just can't fucking function without him. Because he's that special. And people who are statists will say that they believe everyone is equal. Which, of course, is obviously bullshit. They clearly don't believe everyone is equal because they believe there are people like Obama who should be on the receiving end of extraordinary treatment. I mean, can, again, I, this is a movie. Now, imagine taking this into real life. Imagine somebody took Obama hostage or whoever the president is. It could Obama's the president right now. It could have been Bush, whatever. Imagine someone in real life took the president of the United States hostage. How much resources and effort would be expended into getting this one person and saving this one person? While at the same time, all across the country, all across the United States, human life is cheap. Look at how many people we have in prison. Look at how many innocent people are killed in the war on drugs when there are no-knock no, no raids on the wrong house. Look at things like many years ago, I've talked about this on the cast many moons ago, over in Greeley, Colorado, when three cops shot a drunk man who was on his porch with a knife. I mean, again, just the short version. You got three police officers who are trained and they're sober, and you've got one drunk guy on his own property who has a kitchen knife in his hand, and so the cops shot him because they couldn't handle one drunk guy with a kitchen knife because they're a bunch of fucking pussies. I mean, think about all across the United States, all the people who are killed every day by the police. It's not a big deal. Those, all of those lives mean nothing. But there's this one cocksucker. Just because he's the president, we'd stop at nothing. We, there's no we here. The state, the government, would stop at nothing. And then in the movie, there's all these people, people over, like, handing, having candlelight vigils outside the White House and shit. Oh, God. What kind of fucking loser... If the president of the United States really, truly got kidnapped, was being held hostage, what kind of fucking loser would stop their life and go have a candlelight vigil? I'd fucking celebrate. There's good product placement, apparently, on Air Force One. They use bounty paper towels, and they drink Budweiser. Got that. Oh, here's another quote from the movie. If I remember correctly, it was the vice president, played by Glenn Close, who she did a great job. Again, acting all around. Acting was strong in this movie. Great movie. There's a little bit of bad writing. There were some, there were some corny lines here and there, but overall, it's well worth your time. I think it was Glenn Close as the vice president who said, quote, No nation can survive the loss, nor soon replace a great leader. Maybe that's supposed to be of a great leader. But, you know, again, this, this thing, there's this one man. And, oh, if this one man dies, the nation will be crippled. How will the nation survive the loss of this one great man? You sheep out there. You sheep who always need... Someone to look up to. See, and this is one of the problems I have with Davis Aruni. Talked about him before. He's on YouTube. You can find him. Uh, it just Google's. I think it's. I can't remember the name of his channel. His blog. I think it's staresattheworld.com or something. Anyway, Davis Aruni. Look for him. Anyway, Aruni is like this almost anarcho-capitalist guy, but he rags on anarcho-capitalists because he believes in monarchy, because he believes that humans need someone to look up to and someone to give them 
morality. And in a way, I agree with him in the sense that there are many, many people, the majority, the 99%, do need someone to look up to and somebody to tell them right from wrong. I disagree with him in the sense that these are also the people whose DNA should not be in the gene pool. Again, if the state did not circumvent evolution, the sort of people who can't figure out right from wrong on their own are also the sort of people who would be dead and would therefore not be reproducing. The National Security Advisor in this movie got shot in the head. That was fantastic. I love seeing government officials die. I'm not going to lie. It's kind of the high point. I felt bad for the quote-unquote common people in the movie who got killed. But when I saw government officials die, and then like the little press secretary bitch, or she, I shouldn't see on the press secretary, but she was like the press, the press liaison for Air Force One there or whatever. When she is a member of the media and she was in the government. Seeing her die was fucking awesome. That's the fighter pilot. I gave that, giving your life for the state and how sick that is. I did that note. Hey, that was all my notes. That was Air Force One. It was statism galore. Everybody in this movie was just, oh, oh, you have to do the right thing. You have to stand up for you. It was all just pure, pure statism. And statism makes for good movies. Just like the dysfunctional Robinson family makes for a good movie. Because the thing is about movies, conflict is the essence of drama. If you don't have conflict, you don't really have any drama. If you don't have any drama, you don't really have a movie. This is why in theater, we have a saying, keep the drama on the stage. That is to say, we don't want drama in, our, in the backstage. I don't want drama in my life, and I don't have any drama in my life. I have amazingly almost no drama in my life at all compared to most people I know. Like People I know, they're around and they can talk about, oh, this and oh, that, and somebody's doing this, somebody's doing that, and I'm just like, wow, man, I, ha I have none of this. I mean, I really don't. This, I'm not just saying this. I'm, t I don't, I don't have fucking drama. I don't have interpersonal conflicts with people. I've been, ha I haven't had a fight. I mean, not like a fight, like a physical fight, but even a verbal fight. I can't even remember the last time. I mean, like the last time I had a fight with somebody was my girlfriend, like maybe six, seven. Eight years ago, I've talked about it before when we were at the store, and she always bought the cheapest toilet paper, and she grabbed like the cheapest toilet paper. I'm saying like a lot. She grabbed the cheapest toilet paper, puts it in the basket. I'm like, could we buy the more expensive toilet paper so that I can actually wipe my ass without getting shit on my fingers? She's like, it's more expensive. And I'm like, and I'm looking, it's like a dollar more for the pack. And I said, I, look, I took the cheap shit out of her basket to put the expensive shit in. I pulled a dollar out of my pocket and gave it to her. I said, here, I'll pay the extra fucking dollar. Just buy the expensive toilet paper. And that was like one of the only two fights we ever had. Ever. What was the other fight about? Oh, yes. When her friends were over visiting and I fell asleep because I'd been up and working since six o'clock in the fucking morning and she got all upset. But yeah, I mean, that was, that's like the, that's the last time I can remember having a fight with somebody in my life. Like anyone. I don't have any fucking drama. Keep your drama on the fucking stage. But okay, but if you don't have drama in movies and television, they get really boring really fucking fast. So one can understand why, in that sense, from the perspective of creating entertainment, it's easy to understand why Lost in Space has a dysfunctional family. It's easy to understand why everybody in Air Force One is a rabid statist. But still... When you think about 
how many people look at a movie like Air Force One and have these heroic thoughts of how much they worship the president and what they would sacrifice to save the president. Because watching the movie, seeing somebody take a bullet to save the president in the context of the movie is heroic. In real life, anybody who would take a bullet to save a politician, that right there is statism. <laughs>